completely different than what's been talked about before. But I thought it'd be kind of interesting when I talked to Jim earlier uh, just to provide an overview of some of the work that we're doing up at the Clark Fork River Superfund site in Montana. And a lot of the work is being done by our, our group in Menlo Park here. Uh, the Clark Fork River Basin in, in West Central Montana uh, is where this is located and uh, the Clark Fork Superfund site is probably one of the largest Superfund sites, EPA Superfund sites in the U.S. Uh, the mining and smelting operations uh, that were active from around the 1860s and continued to around 1980 uh, when they stopped. Uh, as you can see, most of the operations were in the upper part of the river basin here, below Butte and Anaconda. Uh, and we have, as, as a result of contamination to the stream from uh, flooding events that distributed some of the mine tailings and other mining waste, ended up contaminating more than 250 kilometers of the river downstream. And so we have some study reaches that we've set up uh, over a period of years that run from the upper part of the watershed down below Missoula. Uh, in the lower part of the watershed. And a lot of this work was initiated in the, in the mid to late 80s by Sam Luoma with the USGS. And so what I'm going to report today, uh, talk about today, is a continuation of some of that, some of that work. Uh, just as sort of a chronology of events here, uh, as I mentioned, the, the main source of the contamination was the smelter. And at the time, the Anaconda smelter was the largest copper smelter in the world. And it was active till about 1980. Uh, at that time, actually, early around the uh, turn of the century, there was historic flooding events that occurred, and uh, it distributed throughout the basin uh, a lot of the mine tailings and mine waste. And these ended up along the riverbanks and the flood plains, plains throughout the, the the area down here. And I want to take a note here: Silverbow Creek. Uh, what it looked like uh, prior to the remediation activities. And this is again is in the upper part of the basin. Uh, this was declared a Superfund site in 1989. Uh, restoration began, began uh, soon afterwards. And uh, you can see what Silverbow Creek looked like in 2015 compared to what it used to look like. So this, the remediation efforts have been relatively successful. They're ongoing now, and most of the effort is still focused in the upper part of the basin. And most of this has to do with removal of the contaminated uh, floodplains and bank soils. Well, I want to just uh, give you a few examples of some of the ongoing research that uh, myself and my colleagues are doing in the Clark Fork River uh, Basin. And also uh, mention that um, let me see this here. folks from the, uh, the Montana Water Science Center are all also active in this. And they, they have actually monitoring data uh, probably for the last 30 years or so in the basin in terms of water quality and hydrology. Uh, the main players from our National Research Program in Manila Park is Michelle Hornberger, who is uh, the lead on most of the studies now, and uh, Dan Kane and myself. So uh, just to uh, provide a few examples of some of the activities, one of these is assessing some of the historic and recent contaminant trends, looking at some of the trend data. Uh, and these are primarily targeted to provide EPA with some information on remediation effectiveness. Also, uh, development of field and laboratory models to understand contaminant exposure and uptake kinetics in invertebrate fauna. Uh, and also, one of the things I've been looking at is determinants of metal exposure risk in stream invertebrates, and also some of the mining impacts on uh, ecosystem processes. And lastly, uh, one of the folks at the Montana Science Center has been working on identifying microbial bioindicators of metal enrichment and toxicity uh, in the Clark Fork River system. So uh, the first of these is looking at some of the his, uh, historic and the present trends in uh, bioavailable metals. Uh, in this case, we're using uh, hydrocyclic larvae. And a lot of this work is work that uh, Michelle Hornberger and uh, some of Dan Kane and, and some of the work that Sam Luoma did. And you can see from this plot here, 
see this, but this plot here shows the river kilometers from the headwaters uh, down to about 300 kilometers downstream. And this is concentrations of total metals. Uh, these are based on uh, cumulative standardized values of these metals. So this is a relative metal concentration uh, index here. And you can see in 1997 how these metal concentrations were distributed along the basin. And compare that to 2013 uh, after the remediation period. And you can see the, the changes that occurred there. Well, if we look at individual metals, in this case copper, uh, copper trends in hydrocyclic larvae, uh, again, just looking at uh, 1997 versus 2013, I mean, one of the things that shows up is that in 1997, uh, where you, overall there was a somewhat of a decrease in this upper part of the basin here for total metals. They were still pretty elevated in hydrocyche at that particular time. And one of the ways we've been using these kinds of data is to uh, get a handle on the remediation effects in terms of looking at the distribution and occurrence of uh, these metal loads throughout the system. So this plot here shows a cumulative, is a cumulative distribution plot of the uh, copper concentrations, and this is the standardized concentrations in the caddisfly larvae. And uh, by looking at the piecewise regression here uh, from 1997 data and the 2013 data, you can see that in 1997, uh, concentrations tended to, didn't tend to decrease along the river basin until you got about 60 kilometers downstream. And in 2013, we saw that about 20 kilometers is where we started to see a decrease. So again, we're, we're uh, using these kinds of data here to monitor changes in the spatial distribution of these contaminants uh, in response to remediation and also just some of the natural, natural changes in uh, conditions. There's also a lot of work that's going on in our lab in Menlo Park on looking at contaminant kinetics. Uh, and this includes both the laboratory and, and field models. Uh, the laboratory experiments have been done uh, looking at metal uptake and loss kinetics uh, using enriched stable isotopes. And most of this work, again, is, is uh, being done by uh, Michelle Hornberger, Dan Kane, and Emery Croteau. And uh, they've used a lot of different invertebrate species, including the hydrocyche and arctopsyche catasphyle. And using the uh, stable isotope tracers, they can get a, uh, quantify both the dissolved exposure, the dietary exposure, and the efflux or depuration. And uh, we've also done some field experiments to kind of verify some of these models. And so we did some transplant experiments a few years ago uh, where we transplanted caddis flies from a, a metal contaminated site to an undisturbed tributary to uh, test our model predictions of metal efflux. And we built these little caddis fly retreats that we would put on the stream and uh, look at the efflux rates of these caddis flies after they were moved into a clean system. Well, looking at, based on these kinds of data and, and some related laboratory data, uh, this information was used to refine these biodynamic models that, uh, to predict the metal kinetics in these organisms. And so the models are fairly, fairly straightforward. You've basically got an uptake compartment and a loss compartment. And the uptake, comp and, uh, the uptake compartment uh, consists primarily of uptake from dissolved sources. And uh, as shown here, the metal concentrations in the water. And this includes uh, some of the metal uh, assimilation efficiencies for dissolved metals. And a dietary component, which includes the food ingestion rate, the metal concentrations in the food. And these are all taken over a loss rate constant and loss by growth dilution. And again, most of this work has been done by uh, Michelle Hornberger and some of my colleagues in the lab. Anyway, the results, at least for the caddis fly larvae, uh, indicate that the dietary influx contributes approximately three times the metal input compared to the dissolved sources. And this is pretty consistent with uh, other findings as well, uh, based on some of our field measurements.
Also, we're doing some work in characterizing exposure history, and this plot here uh, shows the uh, predicted copper concentrations in hydropsyche as a function of time and days. And this predicts that hydropsyche catastrophes are going to reach a steady state concentration within two to three weeks. And what's interesting is they have a very rapid efflux rate. Uh, and when the exposure concentrations are removed, the initial rate of efflux is about 20% uh, per day. Um, so they, that's one of the reasons why they're able to tolerate some of these higher metal uh, contaminated sites. And so using these kinds of information and, and also uh, both the lab and the uh, field and laboratory types of uh, studies, uh, we can use this kind of uh, uh, information to kind of predict, in fact, what's going to happen in terms of remediation. This rapid uptake in loss rates may be beneficial in identifying short-term changes that may be due to some disturbance event or also due to some uh, remediation activities which actually are disturbance event in themselves. things that I've been working on in particular is looking at some of the factors influencing metal exposure risk, uh, and particularly looking at ecological traits as determinants of metal exposure risk in stream invertebrates. Uh, I've been developing a trait-based uh, contaminant exposure model uh, which describes the strength of the relationship between uh, species-specific metal uptake and uh, trait expression. So objectives are really to determine the extent to which uh, these traits influence metal exposure history, uh, to identify species that are at greatest risk uh, based on their inherent trait properties, and also to explore the potential for using these trait-based exposure models to uh, understand better the, his the history of the occurrence and distribution of these organisms in these metal contaminated systems. Development of the um, the trace space contaminant exposure model. I use uh, discriminant function analysis and, and uh, related analysis to determine which traits best accounted uh, for differences among the tax and the metal bioaccumulation. And I use the metal concentration test predictor variables for de discriminating among the different trait characteristics. Uh, I looked at a total of 14 traits, and these were related to. Uh, uh, feeding ecology, reproductive strategy, respiration development, dispersal, habitat preferences, and stressor tolerance. And so for an example here, here's just three of the traits, uh, and this shows the relationship between these traits and the metal concentrations. And again, these are uh, total metal concentrations, so these are relative based on this uh, cumulative index. And you can see for development here, uh, we have the non-seasonal, slow seasonal, fast seasonal, uh, body mass, and volcanism. And each of these represents a relative concentration. So I can, I can look at each one of the different traits for the different species, and I can rank these and score these based on their propensity for, uh, that affects their exposure history and their propensity for bioaccumulation. And by doing that, I can develop a scoring metric for, based on these species traits, uh, based on metal exposure and uptake. And this is just an example of a, a list of species here. This radar plot uh, shows uh, contaminant exposure rankings with uh, the exposure and uptake potential increasing in a counterclockwise direction for these different species. And again, these these. This metric here reflects some of the, the different behavioral and physiological properties of these organisms that affects their exposure history. Uh, also, I've been interested in looking at the effects of these uh, metal contaminants in this particular system on some of the ecosystem properties. And uh, one of these is primary productivity. And uh, the objectives here, I wanted to look at to determine the effects of the metal exposure was in fact 
was in fact uh, affecting primary productivity in some sense, and also to look at system level responses uh, throughout the basin uh, to determine if some of the other physical chemical factors, and these are things just the flow velocity, nutrients, light, and so on, were affecting the contaminant uptake, and if this uptake was in fact rate dependent. And lastly, to look at these relationships in terms of contaminant transfer, transfer pathways among the producers and the, and the primary and secondary consumers. And we actually have a paper in preparation now uh, addressing this particular issue. Well, the study is uh, pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. Basically, uh, looked at the rates of paraffin biomass accrual and metal uptake using a, an interval-based sampling using artificial substrates that were placed at several locations throughout the uh, drainage of the Clark Fork River Basin. And I'll show you some results just from four locations, two that are in the upper part of the river basin that tend to have the highest ambient concentrations and two that are in the lower part of the basin. One's on the Blackfoot River, which is more or less a reference site. It's in a drainage basin that is not impacted by metal contamination for the most part. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention here too, that one of the reasons for looking at the paraphyton was is that we wanted to get a handle on some responses to dissolve concentration, knowing that a lot of the aquatic invertebrates weren't really responding as well to that. So, so what we found, uh, at least again looking at uh, dissolved metal concentrations from fairly low at the Blackfoot River increasing to the bottom here, uh, we didn't find any differences in the rates of accrual, the biomass accrual, uh, shown here on these plots at the concentration levels. And just for copper, uh, these ran from about 0.5 to 10 parts per billion. The next thing I was interested in, and, and one of the things we've been working on the last few years, is to look at the relations between bioaccumulation and productivity. And this plot here shows, uh, compares actually arsenic and uh, biomass accrual for two sites. One is the Blackfoot River, which has fairly low ambient metal concentrations and low nutrients. And the bottom plot is for the uh, site further stuff on the Clark Fork River, which has fairly high nutrients and also uh, high ambient metal concentrations. And you can see, and let's see, this plot here shows the, the log of the arsenic concentrations versus the log of the chlorophyll concentrations as a function of time. And you can see basically that there's a, that, uh, the bioaccumulation in this case is a function of the productivity shown on here in the left plot. But what was really interesting, I thought, was the fact that if you looked at the actual concentrations, and this shows uh, concentrations in the paraphyton and micrograms per gram dry weight for arsenic and copper, uh, that they reached the steady state concentra concentration fairly quickly within the first few days, and they didn't change after that. And so here's the this top site here is the one with the highest uh, ambient concentrations. And for both arsenic and copper, you can see that the concentrations reached a, a steady state fairly quickly. And this was apparent at the other sites too, uh, and although at the uh, not not as pronounced probably because the ambient concentrations were lower. Well, given the, uh, the importance of the dietary component, and this was demonstrated by looking at some of the biodynamic models, uh, and I wanted to see if there's differences in the bio bioaccumulation patterns could be attributed to cons consumer status. And so quickly to look at, these are two dietary sources here. This is just an example for arsenic and copper. And you can see paraphyton in the green here as a function of site selection with the metal concentrations increasing from left to right. And you can see that paraphyton accumulate quite a bit more than the catastrophes, the hydropsyche. They're very efficient at accumulating metals. And oops. the way I looked at this was to look at cons uh, consumer responses it was based on comparison of feeding trait states. And for this, I, I examined some 50 species of invertebrates along the river. Uh, these feeding tra uh, trait states are coded based on affinity scores, and they show the relative contribution uh, each type of the feeding behavior to the overall 
food acquisition strategy from zero, which there's no affinity of the species that say to one, which has that trait state exclusively. And so if we look at a predator, a secondary consumer like Clicinia, and looking at the feeding trait states here, you can see that as predation assumes a greater role in its feeding activity, the concentrations tend to go down in those organisms. And in contrast, if you look at a primary consumer, uh, oops, as you look at a primary consumer, uh, it's just the opposite. You can see that, in fact, the concentrations tend to increase at fairly low levels of expression of that particular trait. Lastly, or not lastly, but uh, one of the, the things we just started this summer and are continuing with is to look at the, the role of resource subsidies as contaminant sources, and particularly looking at uh, suspended particulate organic matter. So, uh, developed this little sampler, which uh, we call TAPAS, the Totally Awesome Particulate Acquisition System. And using this, we're able to look at uh, the wet, mat, the wet, dry mass, or organic carbon, chlorophyll, and metal transport, transport per unit time. And then we sample communities down below this, so we can relate these two comparisons in terms of uh, uptake and transport. So we we haven't analyzed all the data yet, but. Uh, uh, it should be pretty interesting, so we're probably going to try to do some more experiments this summer using, or this next summer using this, this particular method. And lastly, I wanted to mention some work that Elliot Barnhart from the uh, Montana Water Science Center is doing, and he's interested in looking at some of the microbial biofilms as indicators of metal toxicity. And uh, one, he wants to, he's using these to gain more of a mechanistic understanding of some of the microbial biofilm responses to metal contamination of the system. And he's been working with us and coordinating some of the studies along with our invertebrate data. Also to assess uh, some of the temporal variability of microbial biomarkers and, and to get a handle on the, how potential the potential of the particular tool is for remediation to identify remediation effects. And ultimately, we'd like to develop a standard microbial metal toxicity assay uh, that it can use using DNA sequencing. And he's presenting some of the results at AGU this year. Now, lastly, I wanted, I wanted to just mention that one of the nice things about doing this study and this work up there is that we get to work with a lot of students. We, we're fortunate that we have some support where we can bring undergraduate and graduate students along to, to do the work, and it makes it uh, really makes it a lot of fun. Thank you.